Good afternoon, I'm Tom Johnson, Vice President of Engineering at AGI, and today we'll be looking at the problem of space object threat analysis, take a look at some of the challenges involved and some possible solutions and approaches that we think we found useful over the, for helping our customers. Okay. Space in general is becoming uh, more and more accessible to the, the worldwide community. Uh, the launch costs are going down, the number of launchers is proliferating, and the cost of actually manufacturing a satellite itself is going down. You know, we're at the point now where high schools and colleges are launching CubeSats, um, and, and it's become a pretty routine process. Um, it's only about $10,000 a pound now to get to orbit, and so as a result, we're seeing a lot more stuff going up into space. Uh, nine, there were 90 launch attempts in 2017, and uh, the, the, uh, the proliferation continues to increase. Uh, we expect 2018 to be even more. Uh, the U.S. is a leading launcher with uh, Russia and China close behind. Okay. As a result, some of the assumptions that we used to make about the space environment are starting to no longer hold true. Um, the, the idea used to be that space was the high ground, space was safe. Once you got on orbit, your spacecraft was in good shape and there weren't, weren't really any concerns other than you know, actual failure of, of components. Um, we had solved most of the technical challenges, uh, dealing with you know, the, the space environment, with radiation. Uh, the satellites are lasting longer and longer and longer. You know, it's not uncommon for a GeoComsat to have a minimum life of 15 years at this point. And of course, the higher your spacecraft orbit is, the longer it would last. However, this is changing. Um, because it's now space is more accessible, there are new threats involved. Um, the most sort of benign threat is simply the other objects that are up there in space. Primarily, we're concerned about debris. So with the, as each launch goes up, there are new debris objects from the launch. Sometimes the satellites that are launched are unsuccessful and uh, die on orbit, and they're now in space that would otherwise be, uh, or in orbits that are commonly shared with other uh, spacecraft objects. And like everything else, you may not exactly know who else is up in space and what they're doing. And so, as a result, that the level of uh, concern or uncertainty about what's going on in space continues to increase. And this problem has been acknowledged by the community um, and been a topic of much discussion in recent years. Um, and so much so that the challenge of operating in space, at least from a government and military perspective, is such that uh, we're now proposing and investigating whether we need a space force to, uh, to help manage and, and, and address the, the challenges of operating in this domain. So th at the end of the day, we, we always have the question, what is my adversary potentially up to, and what can I or should I be trying to do about that? The threat is real. This isn't just a hypothetical. Uh, we do see um, other spacecraft that are operating in manners that are uh, so strange or, or, or not what you would think would be going on. For instance, the Russian uh, spacecraft Lynch Alump is on the move. It's a spacecraft that's in GEO, and what it's doing is it's been seen moving around GEO and parking next to other satellites, primarily commercial communication satellites. Why it's doing that, its reasons are unknown, um, but given how close it parks and it's within the uplink beam width of a ground terminal, the suspicion is that it's doing some sort of uh, signals intelligence or communication collection. Okay. So now, if you've got a spacecraft that's acting in a non-traditional manner, should you be concerned about that or not? Um, another Russian spacecraft was uh, recently seen and believed to be uh, releasing additional spacecraft from it, what we call the Russian nesting doll type uh, program. And, uh, and, and this has been, again, t discussed in the open literature. The Chinese also have another geo, Shijian 17, that has also been seen moving around and parking next to uh, other spacecraft in geo. Um, so the challenge is we want to uh, keep an eye on what these sort of strange behaving spacecraft are doing, but we also have to identify that this behavior is strange in the first place, which means sifting through all the different trajectories and other solutions that are in, for the objects that are uh, normally and well behaved and up there to try to identify who's acting in an abnormal manner. Okay. If once we've identified these objects, the next step really is to say, well, what do I need to do about it? How, how do I need to, to monitor them and be concerned? Um, and we need to assess you know, how much of a threat they could be to some of our other objects in space. 
So typical threat scenario might be to simply understand, can this other spacecraft get close to my spacecraft of interest or my high value asset? And so typically when we look, when we look at that problem, what we're concerned about is what's the delta V or the change in velocity for the adversary spacecraft to try to get close to my spacecraft and how soon can it get there? Because that then uh, backs into the processing and decision making process that I have to go through to try to understand what are my options for responding to that, how long do I have to respond, and, and what levels or courses of action are, might be appropriate. So when we look at this, we've got a lot of things we have to consider and a lot of things we have to analyze. So as we look at for solutions for this, we need to consider all orbit regimes. This is not a problem that's unique to GEO or unique to LEO. We have to be concerned about an object that might be in LEO coming all the way to GEO. Um, we have to worry about ground-spaced assets that are being uh, launched and potentially as an interceptor and, uh, and, and look at all those and analyze all those things in a very timely manner. If it takes too long to do the analysis, by the time I get my answer, it might be OBE, it might be overcome by events. Okay? So it, it all has to happen in, in, a, in a speedy fashion. So in response to this, we started building some tools based on the experiences and some of the sim, simula, simulations and scenarios that we've been involved in to try to address these problems. And as a result, we built our space object threat analysis tool. So this is an example of a one-on-one -on -one analysis and what we can see is that we've identified essentially a chase vehicle and a target vehicle, and you can see those in the, in the uh, bottom corners. And we said, all right, we want, we're concerned that our chase vehicle is going to be approaching our target vehicle. And so we want to understand what's the nature of that type of a rendezvous situation, and when would it get close, and what kind of um, uh, timeline and delta V capability could be involved. So we quickly run through that calculation. In this case, we're looking at a four and a half hour time period uh, that we want to look at. And th these are happen to be two LEO spacecraft. And what we can see is when we do the calculation, we get a result. And you can see in the bottom row, uh, we've got a particular uh, satellite pair. We scored it with a Vanguard number, which is a, is a metric we'll come back to. And uh, we've identified the delta V required to intercept it. In this case, it's 200 plus meters per second. Um, a delta V to, to, get to not only just do an intercept, but potentially do a proximity ops. The difference between the two, an intercept would be a kinetic approach where you're not trying to get stopped in, with a near zero velocity. And with an actual rendezvous, you're trying to, to, to stop near the, the uh, target itself. And we can identify the time of the intercept. When we talk about an intercept, there's multiple possible solutions. It's not just the obvious one, you know, the classic Hohmann transfer or, or a Lambert solution. And so when we look at that, we have to consider all the possibilities. So there might be a direct intercept trajectory. There might be a retrograde intercept trajectory. There might be multiple revs that you can go around so you don't actually have to get it on the first rev or the second rev or the third rev. It kind of just depends on what, what analysis period you want to look at and try to screen over. Uh, and so we, as we go through our analysis, we're considering all of these uh, potential options. So this is an example of how that all plays out. So in this case, we have a LEO climbing up to a higher altitude uh, intercept. And what we've done in this case is actually showed uh, all the potential uh, trajectories that we're scanning through and looking at. And we're actually drawing them as they come off and in, uh, in, in, in approach at different time periods. And in this case, we've color coded it based on the relative time of flight. Um, in this case, you know, short to long. And, uh, and you can see that there's, there's uh, many, many different solutions that are being evaluated and processed. Um, this is a typical engineering debug type display so we can see what's going on. So the net result is getting a variety of output plots and reports. So what we can see here is a typical carpet plot on the far left side showing the delta V on the bottom and the time of flight on the uh, Y axis. And what we can see is there are definitely hot spots and cold spots here where there are minimum delta V requirements. So if we look in the top left corner at the dark blue regions, we can see that those are the minimum delta V parts or, or, or op opportunities as indicated by the color bar next to the graph where dark blue is on the bottom showing minimum delta V. 
So this gives us an idea of uh, the tip-off times when if a spacecraft's going to try to do an intercept, these are likely candidates for doing that because it, they're sort of the minimum or, or, or smaller delta V requirements. Of course, there is no constraint that says the adversary is going to do a minimum delta V trajectory. It's just a likely trajectory that they might choose to pick. So this allows us then to focus our sensor scheduling and tasking based on looking at these particular times and that might be of more interest if we want to do a very quick timely maneuver detection to see if they are actually executing one of these strategies. The same information is available in a three-dimensional display as you can see on the right. This is an example of a highly, inclined, or highly eccentric orbit uh, trying to intercept a geo. This might be something, something that's similar to a GTO type situation trying to get to geo. And again, we've got delta V on the bottom axis, or I'm sorry, um, delta V on the bottom axis. We've got time of flight on the top. And we're looking at the, um, the, the, uh, the part, oh, I can't read the graph, sorry. <laughs> You're going to have to edit. We've got departure delay on the bottom and time of flight on the, on the y-axis. And again, we're plotting the delta V required to get from the HEO, for the HEO to intercept the GEO. So in this case, our, we have a minimum time as indicated by a couple of these dark blue dots in the center. And we can take a look at what's involved in order for it to get there. Again, this allows us to focus our, our efforts and our activities around trying to identify, is this a plan that they're actually executing? And um, when they might be doing so. And because this also gates what my response time is going to be. So for instance, my, uh, my time of flight, if it's going to get there before I can make a decision or before I can react fast enough, then that says that I've got a challenge trying to defend my particular spacecraft. This is a geo on geo example. And you'll notice, again, there's the minimum delta Vs in the top left corner. And, but there are other opportunities there, again, depending on how much delta V budget that the, the uh, adversary may have and, what, again, what their goals are. So as we look at this, we, we want to make sure that we're tasking appropriately. Okay. So the net result is, you know, you get the plots out. You also can do, um, you get the reports out. Now, the examples we just looked at were one-on-one. -on -one. But in reality, you're concerned about potentially many-on-many. -many because you may have one or more adversary spacecraft and you may have a whole family of uh, high value assets that you're concerned about. So you don't want to run one on one, you actually want to do N on, on many. Um, and again, you can specify that. So in our case, we've got multiple chase vehicles here in the bottom middle and we've got multiple target vehicles and we're trying to do an analysis against all of them. And as a result, you get a whole table of results uh, showing up in the bottom. And what we're identifying here are the minimum delta V times. Um, now, again, these are the likely times when there might be an intercept. Um, but there may be other options, as we saw from the graph. So the operator can easily dig into any one of these rows and pull up any of the plots that we were looking at to see you know, in more detail what some of the other options might have been. Now, when you start doing mini on mini type of analysis, um, you might want to pull up a plot to sort of score for a particular high value asset or a particular adversary what they might be going after. And the way we look at that is we actually can score an, a, each particular opportunity for you know, one adversary against one high value asset and start to score what, what's the likelihood that we think uh, this adversary might be going after this particular spacecraft. And we came up with a cost function we call the Vanguard number. And the van we use the Vanguard number. It reflects essentially the delta V and the time of flight necessary for a particular pair of objects to get close to each other. And you can see a plot of that for a particular uh, adversary spacecraft here, where the Vanguard number is quite low on the bottom left corner, and then it increases rapidly. And this allows us to essentially identify the likely objects that a particular spacecraft may be going after. This is a tool we actually use operationally within our ComSpoc to help understand as a particular spacecraft starts to relocate or do something strange, we're trying to predict ahead where it might be going and potentially uh, any particular satellites that it might be uh, parking, trying to park next to. The most vulnerable ones are in the bottom left. Those are the ones with the lowest score Vanguard number. 
and then it increases up from there. For future work, um, what we're looking at now is applying these same concepts to the direct ascent ASAT problem, where instead of having an orbiting vehicle on an orbiting vehicle, we're actually looking at a ground launch uh, type of a, a ASAT and going up to, in this case, we're, we're showing something that's going up to GEO. What makes this a little bit different is that in this case, we're allowing for the fact that that uh, ASAT or that direct ascent may actually have an onboard uh, seeker with its own delta V capability. And so we want to understand as it's going up on a particular trajectory, if that seeker has an additional delta V capability, who could it get to and at what time if it started to fire its thrusters? Um, and so we want to take a look at that and, uh, and, and assess that. So we're going to actually gonna go back and I'm going to replay that. And what we can see is as the ASAT's rising, uh, we've color coded the longitude rank band and geo for which ones it's, it's able to get to, low threat or high threat. And, uh, and then, of course, as it gets higher up and closer to geo, the number of points that it can reach starts to shrink because of the, it has a limited delta V capability and it has less time to actually use that. So the closer I get to geo, the higher I get to geo, the less opportunity there is to actually intercept somebody. So the sooner we know the, what a trajectory is, we can start running this analysis process and we can continue to refine who's at risk or what areas are at risk as time continues to evolve. This is essentially a two-dimensional plot of what you just saw in three dimensions. And again, we've got departure time on the bottom. We've got the longitude of the potential objects that are in question uh, on the, on the y-axis. And we can take a look at different divert delta Vs that the uh, ASAT may have. And as we look at the, the different ranges of options, what longitude band it can get to uh, as a function of the uh, departure delay. And we can see that in the, uh, in the graph here. So in summary, the, the, the idea of being safe in space is no longer as, uh, as good of an assumption as it used to be. Um, again, with the proliferation of launchers and space vehicles, uh, there are real threats up there. They're being analyzed and looked at. Um, we need to be able to, in a position where we can quickly analyze these problems and respond in a timely manner. It doesn't do me any good to have a great analysis three days after the fact. Um, so we want to make sure that we, we've got tools that are operationally relevant. Um, we've got to do it in a, in a timely fashion and quickly identify and, and give the operators information that's actually actionable. And so we can say, with this particular adversary, this is who's at risk and now the operator can start to explore their courses of action.